Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Murray of Drea Renee Knits and today's episode is going out a little later than usual. Um, we were traveling and just getting back home, getting into the swing of things. Uh, we've had some stuff getting done on our house and it's just been one of those weeks. So this is going out a little late, um, but I will not miss a week. I've been trying real hard to make sure I get one of these out every week. So let's just hope I have no upload issues. Okay, let's jump into it. I am wearing the Inclinations cowl today. We are in the final few weeks of the knit along. There is just under three weeks left ish. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. And 19 days. I was really trying to do that math in my head. Um, so it ends at the end of this month. And I knit one out of my hand spun for my daughter. And now my son's like, where's mine? <laughs> so I had spun up this yarn for him. It has some of his favorite colors in it. And so since he brought it up the other day, I was kind of trying to decide do I want to knit him like hat or some little mittens but he wants a cowl as well so I am going to hopefully cast that on for him um before the end of the knit along I don't know if I'll finish it before the end of the knit along but maybe let's cross our fingers uh but there is a link below if you want to go check out the knit along it's not too late to join you could probably cast on and still finish one before the end if you want to um but even if you just want to see some beautiful inclination cowls to get inspiration for your own it's a great place to head once you're in the knit along forum you can click over to the finished page there's a link at the top with all the fo's with all the finished objects and so there you can just see pictures of everybody's finished cowls that have finished up um or you can just head on over to instagram i'll put that hashtag below as well if you're not on Ravel you can check out the knit along on Instagram as well. It is the Inclina Cowl knit along, um, but I'll put that below so you know how to spell it. All right. Um, mine that I'm wearing is the original. It is knit out of two spin cycle dyed in the wool colorways. Um, I always want to call it Buzz Light Ear. It's just light ear. <laughs> yeah, little kids. Um, and oh gosh, it was just on the tip of my tongue. purpley one. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It'll come to me. It's on the pattern page. But anyways, so let's jump into some questions. Do, do, do. As a newbie designer, I was wondering when you include gauge in a pattern, do you measure the gauge from the finished object or from the swatch you made before you started the pattern? Or from somewhere else in between. So I always take gauge from the finished project. Um, that's going to be the most accurate and what I want knitters to match so that their project can turn out similarly. Um, so I always, usually, I start with a gauge swatch. I'm going to be really honest here and say that there are times where I might not swatch for something, um, but that's usually just because I'm very familiar with the yarn, needle combination, used it before, um, and, or it's, I know the fabric I like and that I'm going to get and gauge is something I can kind of determine throughout the design process. Um, so yeah, I always, always, always take it from the finished project, but, um, I do recommend starting with a gauge swatch so that your sample, the first one you knit to write that pattern from, if that is your method, um, can turn out accurate as well. And hopefully those should match at the end. Um, but yeah, I always take it from the finished piece. Uh, do you have any tips for learning continental knitting? I learned to knit English style a very long time ago, but I'm keen on trying continental as it looks to be quicker and less straining on the hands. I've tried and tried, but I can't get the hang of it. I really want this to be closer to me. Um, do you prefer one over the other? Is it possible to get the hang of the opposite style to that which you've been doing for a long time or can you just not teach an old dog new tricks? Um, so I'm going to go through this one by one. Um, I do have tips for learning continental. I have shared them before but I get this one a lot so I feel like it's nice to revisit it. Um, so when I learned continental I basically 
really learned it because when I started teaching, I realized how important it was to be able to demonstrate the technique I was teaching in both English and continental style knitting. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, depending on what hand you hold your yarn in while you knit determines what kind of knitter you are. So there are two that we tend to hear about the most frequently. There are a couple other styles of knitting as well. Uh, but the two that you tend to hear a lot are English and continental or picking or throwing. So if you hold your yarn in your right hand while you knit, that is called English knitting. It's also known as throwing because you kind of pick up the yarn and throw it around your needle. Continental knitting or picking is when you hold the working yarn in your left hand. And it's called picking because you tend to pick with the needle um, the yarn off your finger to make that stitch. And a lot of times people want to learn continental if they've been previously taught English because of what this person had kind of mentioned that um, it tends to be quicker and sometimes there's less muscle strain on the hands. Um, as far as quickness goes, I don't think that's necessarily true. I know very, very, very fast English knitters and I know very, very fast continental knitters. I personally knit much faster English. Um, now I'm pretty quick with continental, but it took me a long time to get there because I had been knitting English style since I was a kid and that I just knew it so well. I never, ever had to look down. I still, and I've been knitting continental now for quite a long time, um, still find that I have to look at my work more frequently. It's, it's like that, that feeling still isn't perfect, um, for me to, just never look down. So just to throw those little caveats out there because I never want anyone to think that they need to learn a different style of knitting. If you are creating knit fabric that you like, that's all that matters. Um, that being said, as far as the relieving some of that muscle uh, tension, any repetitive strain injury, anything like that, I am pro learning a new style to knit just because it did make a difference for me. So I was a baker before I did this and um, it was actually pie crust. I always made pie crust by hand and I would make giant batches, batches of it. Wow, a little Midwest accent came out there for a second. Um, and I rubbed all the butter in by hand. I was kind of known for making these really amazing vegan pop tarts, but it gave me really bad carpal tunnel. There was something about that rubbing, pinching motion of getting that butter into that flour that just did my hands in. There was something about the English style of knitting that would trigger that carpal tunnel and I would get more fatigued. I would get kind of aches in my, um, this part of my arm. <laughs> in my hands and thumbs and stuff. So a very great little uh, bonus to when I did learn Continental and accidentally switched was it did relieve my hands pain. I can now knit for quite a long time and I don't usually have any issues with pain um, or strain unless I like really overdo it. And, um, but like when I spin, it kind of replicates that pinching motion again. And if I am doing something tricky that I can tell I'm tensing up more, it'll trigger that same pain. So I will say Continental for me did help my hand pain and I think it could help in reverse for other people. I think people who have been knitting Continental for years and years and years might find some relief in English style or Portuguese style or whatever style of knitting you wanna try because it makes us kind of use up some different muscles in our hands and gives the ones that have been overworked a little bit of relief. Um, so, sorry, this is gonna be a long one. Can you tell I like talking about this? <laughs> um, so, all that to say, yes, you might find bonuses there. You might end up being quicker once you get the hang of it and you might find some relief for your hands. Um, I don't prefer one method over the other. I never had any intention of switching the way I knit permanently. As I said, I learned because I needed to be able to demonstrate while teaching both styles because there are some techniques that can look really confusing when somebody's holding the yarn in the opposite hand that you hold it, such as brioche, which is my favorite thing to teach. Um, we yarn over differently depending on which hand we're holding that yarn in. So it really became important for me to learn and, like, and be competent at demonstrating that. Um, I also did love using 
continental four color work because I wanted to hold one color in each hand. So I, I would actually knit both English and continental at the same time for color work. Um, which brings me to my tip for getting started. I found that starting with color work, trying to do that with two hands is what got me on the way to learning how to knit continental. When I would focus solely on switching over, not even switching over, but just learning continental, I it's like I would overthink it. And my hands would feel so clumsy. It can very much feel like you're a beginner again. And it can just be uncomfortable. You're using your hands in a different way and it really, really will slow you down at first. Um, but there was something about when I was doing color work that because I was still knitting English style at the same time, I wouldn't overthink the continental side. And it just had a really good flow to it. So you might wanna try that just to start getting comfortable with it, start getting your left hand a little more used to being used in that way. Um, now, as I said, when I did start focusing on not color work, because I wasn't really demonstrating color work in my class, um, I needed to be proficient in just continental straight up. Um, that was probably the hardest part for me was how slow it was. When you are learning something new, but you've been doing that technique so you're learning a new style, but you've been doing the thing for a really long time, such as me, I've been knitting for a very, very long time. Um, it's your brain and your body, I mean, they just wanna get into their rhythm and they just wanna go, go, go. And it's hard to be like, oh, I cannot just like quickly do this. For me, the trickiest bit was actually tensioning my yarn. When I knit English style, I actually don't have to tension my yarn at all. It just runs over my finger. I don't wrap it around any other fingers. It's just smooth, easy peasy. Continental, I have to tension around my pinky. And it took me a long time to figure out how to tension with my left hand in a way that it wasn't what it felt like at first for me was I constantly had to drop the yarn, pick it up and retension, drop the yarn, pick it up and retension. So it was really slowing me down. And half the reason that Continental can be faster than English is because you're doing this very quick picking motion instead of this wrapping a lot of times English knitters will wrap and even drop their yarn you know in between each stitch which is going to be much slower than if you're just picking the yarn off of your finger um so as far as tips go try maybe some two-handed color work to get comfortable without overthinking it realize you're gonna slow down you're gonna be slower at first than you are as an English knitter and it's just part of the process. It took me over a year to become quick at Continental. Um, have Continental dedicated projects and then keep some English ones going on the side. That way when you just want to be able to get into your knitting flow and not be sitting there challenging your brain and your hands to do something different, you've got that project that you can just you know, zip along with. Um, also, a lot of people, their gauge tends to be different between when they're knitting English and when they're knitting Continental. So I don't recommend just switching back and forth within a project because you might get some pretty wonky sections of your gauge changing. So definitely try to keep it in two separate projects unless you're doing the two handed color work, um, which my gauge always seemed to smooth out when I was doing color work in that way. Um, ba -dum -bum. And so yes, it's absolutely possible to get the hang of knitting the opposite way. And again, I don't prefer one over the other. I did not mean to switch to Continental. Basically, once I became very proficient and was using it in my classes, one day I just realized I kept, like, that's just how I was picking up my knitting. And I was like, oh, I've just been knitting Continental. Once in a while, I love how much I did not need to look at my knitting as an English knitter. And my hands, as I said, just still seem to like that a little bit better without me needing to look. I, it's like I can feel it better. So every once in a while, I will purposely knit English style. Um, but I find that after a while, it's like I can't find my old groove with it as much. And I always end up going back to Continental now. So, but, um, but I don't think one is better than the other. All right, I think that was all the questions in that one. So yeah, just give yourself some grace, slow down, have a dedicated easy project for it too. Like just, just start with knitting, you know, do something, a garter stitch something or um, knit a hat in the round or a pair of socks where you can just knit, knit, knit until that gets comfortable and then maybe do something with ribbing so you can practice your pearls as well. Okay, 
next question. Oh, I loved this one. Uh, so this question reminded me of myself and how I would read patterns very literally. And this one, the wording, I agree, is kind of funny um, and is really easy to overthink. So I thought this was such a great question, um, especially if there's anybody who's a little bit newer at knitting. So I have been struggling with something. If a pattern tells me to pick up and knit stitches for the neckline, does that mean that after I have all the stitches on the needles that then I should knit one round after that? Wouldn't it then be clear to say, pick up stitches around the neckline and knit one round? Or does pick up and knit mean that when you have a stitch on your needle, you have already knit it? This is just very confusing to me. I agree. I can totally, totally see that. So it is not knitting an extra round. It is the process of picking up stitches. Basically what you're doing is you are inserting your needle into a gap and you're knitting a stitch onto it as you pull it out. So that's why, so you pick it up and you knit it. That's basically, you can just think of it as picking up stitches. Um, that's how I tend to think about it in my head. I think we write it technically to be like technically correct because you're you're knitting all of those, those that first round of picked up stitches have technically been knitted on kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, so pick up and knit is all the one thing. It's inserting your needle, wrapping your yarn around and pulling it through. That is it. Um, so a designer is not expecting you to knit another round after that unless they have specifically told you. And now knit one round. Um, so I hope that helps. Okay, short rows. I am knitting a tee that starts with short rows. If I could insert a picture, it would surely give you a good laugh. I have two huge holes after I knit all the double stitches. Please help. Do you have a short row tutorial? Why am I getting holes? So um, it sounds to me like nothing has been done to close the gap. So when we are working short rows, what we're doing is working. It's like times like this. I just need like a piece of stockinette fabric. <laughs> um, I'm just going to hold up this cowl. Um, so basically when we are working a short row, we are going to knit part way across our row or around, but then instead of finishing it, we're actually going to turn our work and start working back the other way. And this creates a short row within our longer rows. And we do this for all sorts of reasons. The main reason I use it, if it's in shawls, I'm usually using it as a design feature. Um, and when it is in sweaters, it's for shaping. So most of my sweaters will have some sort of short rows around the back, neck, shoulder region to create that nice slope from um, the neck down to the shoulders or to give a rise at the back neck so our sweaters aren't too tight in the front. Um, so to do that, we build up fabric in an area by working shorter rows back and forth, and then we go back to working the whole piece. Now, the thing about this is when you work part with your row and then you turn and go the other way, you are going to have a hole at the end of that row unless you do something to close it up because basically the row never got finished. So you have to pull the row from below kind of up to meet you, um, to meet the row above it so that there's not those gaps at the end. Short row methods generally are going to have something in there to tell you how to do that. So the most classic tends to be the wrap and turn method. And with that method, you work however many stitches your pattern says, and then you wrap the last stitch with your yarn. So usually you do this by, if you've been knitting, you bring your working yarn to the front, slip a stitch, bring the working yarn to the back, and then return that stitch to the other needle. And that means that it's been wrapped around the base of it with your working yarn. Once you come across this again, what you have to do is use your needle tip to lift that little wrap and work it with the stitch it had wrapped, either by knitting it or purling it. Um, and there's different ways to do that depending on if you are on the right side of your work or the wrong side of your work to make it as invisible as possible. Um, I always try in my patterns, I always write kind of how you need to do that on the notes page. Um, but there's 
so many different ways to do short rows. There's Japanese short rows that use a stitch marker. There are German short rows, which tend to be a crowd favorite. So you might want to look those up. Um, a lot of people like German short rows. Basically what you do is instead of wrapping a stitch, you slip the stitch and then you pull the yarn so that it kind of tightens that stitch up over your needle and it looks like it looks like two stitches next to each other but it's actually the legs of that one stitch and you work those together and that will also close that hole so there are a lot of different methods to this i would be curious to see if your pattern told you which of those methods you're using because that's going to kind of determine how to close up those holes um but there is a great class carol feller has um, a craftsy class for free that's a little short row tutorial at least she used to i think it's still up there um that's amazing otherwise she also now offers a master class on her website and i need a pen um will link my pens are stuck <laughs> behind this sorry everybody you're gonna look out my window for a second uh, okay um i will link that below hide my studio is just a mess after traveling and getting back and now having to finish all the work so um okay short roll classes i want to make sure i link those for you um, but I highly recommend them. And what I love is that she goes through different styles because as I have said before, one of the things I love about knitting is the fact that we can get to the same end goal in many different ways. And I feel like that allows us as individual knitters to kind of get there the way we want to get there. And short rows is my favorite example of that because there's so many different ways to do it. So you do you and find the way you like and I will link those below all right um hi I absolutely love your sweaters and several of them are in my knitting queue but I keep putting them off because I live in warm and humid Florida and I just don't wear long sleeve sweaters often do you have any tips for converting patterns to a short sleeve are there construction methods that would work better for this, such as yoked versus drop shoulder versus raglan? Should recommended ease be a consideration? I imagine a sweater with a lot of ease would result in droopy or baggy sleeves. Are any other considerations that I should think about? So I think that this should be a pretty easy modification. Really, all you're going to do... I would recommend... <laughs> doing this on top down sweaters or in any sweater where the sleeve is knit from the top down because that is going to be the easiest to modify because what you can do is you can try it on once that little short sleeve is the length that you like it you can just knit some ribbing um and you might want to play around with shaping you might decide that you want to depending on how much ease is in the sweater, if you want it to be a tighter little sleeve cap, you might want to decrease a bunch of stitches out kind of quickly and then do your ribbing. Um, but in general, I would say most patterns, it would work great with top-down raglans. It would work great with um, round yoke sweaters and with drop shoulder. Drop shoulder, you could almost just knit, like pick up your sleeve stitches it, for all of these you could just um, do like an inch and then add some ribbing depending on how long you want it so that's why top down will be really nice because you can try it on and see how long you want those short sleeves but that should be a pretty easy one to modify for sure um, let's just give it a go i think you could do any of those styles successfully um oh i was so excited i had i just wanted to tell everybody so in the last episode we had talked about somebody was asking about the weekender and they were having trouble getting laddering after the faux seam and so my suggestion was to tug on the second stitch away from that faux seam to try to help tighten it up. And they emailed me and let me know that it worked really great. So yay. So um, again, if you are ever dealing with laddering, whether it be in that scenario where you have a slipped stitch, 
um, and that was followed by a pearl. And I think that was kind of the issue there. But um, even like with DPNs or magic loop in the gaps, the first thing to try is to try giving an extra tug on the second stitch in from the problem, from the ladder. If you just tug on the first stitch, it actually seems to kind of exasperate the situation. So tugging on the second really seems to help. Um, there, I also have a bonus question here. Um, this person, I think I had maybe meant to link to this at one point and forgot, um, or maybe I did, maybe I remembered, but I thought it doesn't hurt to do it again. So bonus question is, I heard you know of a company that you can send your PDF sewing patterns to have printed on large sheets. Um, I'd love to send my PDF patterns there. It's so hard to work with a bunch of taped together sheets. So generally for those of you who may not be sewists, um, your sewing patterns, if you don't buy hard copy versions at a store, you get emailed a PDF and you can either print them off as tiles on your home printer, or you can send them to a company that can print them off on big sheets of paper. If you print them off at home, you basically have to like cut off the selvages and tape them all together. And for me, the thing I like about having them printed on big paper is I don't cut out my paper pattern. I use Swedish tracing paper on top and cut that out so that if I ever wanna make a different size, make one for somebody else, I still have everything intact on the big paper roll. So I tend to roll those up and put them all in a basket standing up so that I can revisit them. Um, so the company I've used the most often is called PDF Plotting, and I will put a link down below for you, uh, but other companies do it too. I know that I think Blackbird Fabrics does it, Closet Core might do it. I think U Fiber, who does the amazing sewing kits I've talked about in the past, they do make the look bundles um, where you still have to buy the pattern, but they'll print it for you on those big sheets and send it along with all of your sewing supplies. Um, so yeah, there are some pretty amazing options out there and I do love that because I, I re-sew the same patterns again and again and I like to be able to go back and um, maybe do a different size, maybe grade between sizes. There's lots of reasons to keep that big paper one intact. Um, okay, I think that kind of does it. Our fifth annual knit along for Ryan Beck is about to kick off. The forums are already open. I have those linked below. We've got it going on Ravelry and Facebook. Um, so people are already sharing their yarn colors and asking questions. And the DRK Spin It to Knit It Knit Along is going on. I have been really racking my brain, kind of going back to the drawing board um, for my own weekender <laughs> to see what I want to spin. I'm also a little tempted. I don't know if y'all remember this spin. Um, I have four skeins of this and I don't, I don't think it's quite enough, but this is my first woolen spin. And this is a marled yarn that... The fiber comes from my local port fiber and my friend and the owner Casey dyes the fiber and I loved these two blues and so I actually turned it into Rolags that I spun woolen from. Um, Oh, this feels so nice and squishy but it's definitely uneven and the marl actually kind of shows off the unevenness even more um but the weekender is traditionally i made it out of woolen spun yarn from brooklyn tweed and i think it would be pretty delightful now up in this i just don't know if i have enough i think i have like 16 ounces and i don't think that's enough so I don't know. We'll see. I also had thought about knitting a sweater out of the or a vest out of this. So decisions. I think if I don't use this, I am going to do a combination spin just like I was originally attempting, but just with different colors. I think I want to do something maybe a little more muted. Um, so yeah. And I think I already showed this, right? I did. That's how I started off. Okay, well, I think that is it for today, and I'm going to hurry up and get this uploaded so that it is actually here today on Friday instead of 
tomorrow. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. I hope to see you back here next week. Thank you for submitting your questions. I wouldn't be able to get to this every week without your questions. So keep them coming. You can add your questions through the link below in the show description. It's at the very bottom and it takes you to a form you can fill out. That's the easiest way for me to try and stay organized and answer your burning questions about knitting and sometimes about other things too. All right. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you get to make something and I'll see you back here next week. Happy knitting.